So Clay received his BA in physics and mathematics from Columbia University in 2007 and his PhD from Harvard in 2012. After that, he was a junior fellow in the Harvard Society of Fellows, and he came to the Institute as a long-term member in 2015. Now, Clay's topic is going to be a topic, topology and physics, which is very wide-ranging, and uh, we're all excited to see how Clay manages to tell us something about it in 15 minutes without audiovisual aids. Uh, so there are applications of physics to topology, applications of topology to physics, and just within physics, there are many different branches of physics that come in, ranging from condensed matter physics to quantum field theory and string theory, among others, even er some areas of classical physics, perhaps fluid mechanics. Uh, so uh <coughs> I will add one more word, which is that I don't know anything about how Clay is going to use these nice props that he's got on the table here, so we'll all look forward to seeing that. All right, thanks very much. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about one aspect of the interplay between topology and quantum physics, which is the different kinds of particles that can exist in nature. So we're gonna see how topology constrains the different kinds of particles. I'm blowing in the wind here. So, uh, so let's start the discussion with classical physics. So what's a classical particle? A classical particle, you should think, is something like a billiard ball. So it has some simple size and shape. Maybe you hold it in your hand. Maybe it's got some mass and some color and some other properties. And it's helpful when thinking about particles to think about their trajectories. So for instance, even if a, uh, I hold the particle in my hand and it doesn't seem to go anywhere in space, it still has some trajectory. So let's imagine this direction is space and this direction is time. Then as the particle goes along, it makes what's called a world line. So here I've got a piece of rope to illustrate a world line. So we've got uh, the particles not moving anywhere in space, but it is moving along through time. Okay, so we like to think of world lines when we think about particles. Now, that's one particle. What about two particles? So now imagine you have two particles. Again, classical particles. Say two billiard balls, both the cue balls, so they look identical. And one is in your left hand and the other is in your right hand. Now, uh, as they go on, uh, as they move on through time, they again trace out some kind of world line. So they could sit there in my left and my right hand. What does that look like? So that looks sort of like this. They stay separate. They don't really talk to each other. They just move on through time. Now there's other possibilities, right? What happens if they exchange? So if they are, one is in my left hand and one is in my right hand, and as time goes on, they slowly rotate around each other. And that's a different history that these particles could, could do. That's a different trajectory. And that looks something more like this. So they never touch each other. They go through time, and they, they exchange. So by the time you get up to the top, the guy who was on the left is now on the right, and vice versa. So these are two different histories of the particles. There's two different world lines that distinguish them. And it's important that in classical physics, these two trajectories can be distinguished. That sounds somewhat trivial. After all, one of the particles is in your left hand and the other is in your right hand. But it's really true because classical physics is deterministic. So you can always tell which particle is which. Okay, so that's classical physics. We've learned about world lines and different histories that two particles can have. Now I'd like to switch gears and tell you about quantum physics where the story will be completely different. So in quantum physics, the basic difference is that identical particles are indistinguishable, meaning that there is no in principle experiment that can be done to tell you which particle is which. So again, uh, if we have two particles, even if I know them, their histories right now, the trouble is that quantum mechanics is probabilistic is not a deterministic theory. So there's some probability that the particles will continue like that, and there's some probability that they'll have the different world line where they exchange places. Now, uh, what does that mean in practice? Well, this, this dichotomy will lead us to two fundamentally different kinds of particles, which will be called bosons and fermions. And I'd like to explain to you how that comes about. So imagine we have the two, two quantum particles. So they can have this trajectory or this trajectory. 
and a variety of other trajectories that I'm not talking about. Now, we have quantum mechanics is a probabilistic theory, and we'd like to understand how we compute probabilities. And what we do when we compute probabilities in quantum mechanics is we average over all these different histories that the particles can, can have. So one is where they go along in time, and the other is where they exchange. What does it mean to do an average? We have to add up trajectories. How do we do that? So it's helpful to think about the trajectories using what's called wave particle duality, where we remember the fact that for some purposes, quantum particles behave as waves. So imagine you have a wave, it's got a peak and a trough, and a peak and a trough, and another wave, and you want to add them up. So if they're aligned, when you add them up, the peaks get bigger and the troughs get deeper, and so on. If they're misaligned, when you add them up, there can be cancellations, the wave can get smaller. So that's, that's in some sense how we add particle trajectories. Now, it turns out that when we add particle trajectories, we get to make a choice, and the choice is whether we add these two histories, this one or this one, with a plus sign or a minus sign. The first case is called a boson, the second case is called a fermion. So let me give you an example. A photon, the particle of light, is a boson. That's responsible for a variety of phenomena. For instance, lasers uh, come about because bosons, because we add with a plus sign, like to be in the same state. And a laser is a bunch of photons all doing the same thing at once, and that's what gives us this big bright light. Now there's the other possibility, which is a fermion. That's where we add with a minus sign. And when we do that, there can be cancellations. And in particular, fermions cannot occupy the same state at the same time. And this is responsible for essentially all of chemistry. So for instance, the electron is a fermion, and we learn in chemistry that there's an atomic nucleus and there are electrons, and instead of the electrons piling in all as close as they can to the nucleus, they have to fill in in sequence. And this fills out the per periodic table of elements. That's true because the three space dimensions. It has up, down, back, forth, left, right. But there are some physical circumstances where it would be in, where it's, uh, physics is confined to lower dimensions. So for instance, you could imagine that I apply a big magnet and study matter that can only move on the surface of this podium, so it's completely trapped here. And then, for the purpose of that physical experiment, the universe looks two-dimensional. So we can only go back, forth, and left, right, but we can't get off. So then it looks two-dimensional. And in this two-dimensional universe, there's other kinds of particles that are possible. These are called anions. So uh, maybe I should say what anions are. So anions exist in two space dimensions because there are somehow more ways for particles to braid around each other in, in two space dimensions. So this is a picture, you should remember this is two space dimensions because this is time. And here you see I've made a braid. So this is two space and one time dimension. That's exactly what would be going on on the surface of this table. And this way that particles can uh, move around each other, that they can be stuck braiding around each other, is special to two space dimensions. If we have more space dimensions, there's too much room. We can uh, undo the braid. Yeah. You can ask about that more in the discussion section if you're curious. Okay, so what's special about anions is that instead of adding these two trajectories with either a plus sign or a minus sign, we add them with using a more general angle. So there's some angle, and in the special case when the angle is zero or 180 degrees, so in general in physics, uh, the term on just means particle, like proton, electron, neutron, positron. Bosons are named after Bose. This is an Indian physicist from the 1920s who studied those particles. Fermions are named for the Italian-American physicist Enrico Fermi from the same period. By contrast to these uh, honorific names, the name anion is more of a wisecrack. Uh, it just means any and on fused together. And it's that because essentially the particles have almost any property when they are exchanged. So they have, that's where that name comes from. So anions are not just a theoretical possibility. They have been produced numerous times in real experiments. The pioneering experiments were done in the 80s by uh, Stormer and Sui. And for that work, they received the Nobel Prize in the, around the year 2000. 
And to this day, uh, the study of anions is very rich and active, so there's an experimental component with some physicists trying to find newer and more exciting materials to make more and more rich and exotic kinds of anions. And there's also a theoretical component where people like myself and Edward and others at the IAS are studying the interactions of anions and how to describe them theoretically and what kind of ways you can use to produce them out of ordinary matter, which are bosons and fermions. Okay, so there's a, there's a very rich interplay with anions and topology, which I alluded to before, but I'd like to describe in more detail now. And the way that interplay comes about is essentially because of the properties of the vacuum. Let, let's get into it that way. So when you think about the vacuum in classical physics, you usually think that the vacuum is sort of a void. There's nothing there. Now that's a very classical notion. And in quantum physics, the vacuum is nothing like that. The vacuum is a very rich and violent place. Particles are being born and dying all the time, popping into existence. There's a kind of quantum froth. So imagine you have some process where a pair of particles pops into existence. They separate for a little while, and then they come back together and annihilate. What does that look like in our world line description? It looks something like this loop here. So here down here, the particles were born, and they separated, and they traveled for some time, and then up here they died. So we've made a kind of loop of string from these particle trajectories bubbling into existence out of the vacuum. Now, once you see that that is possible, you can envision all sorts of more interesting possibilities. So for instance, here's another one. The particles are born, separate, and then they do a little dance of some kind, and then they annihilate up here. And this makes what mathematicians call a knot. So a knot is some kind of loop of string that cannot be untangled without being cut. And here you can see that. This is somehow persisting. No matter what I try to do, I can't undo this tangle. This is a simple kind of knot called a trefoil. Now there are all sorts of knots. This is Let's save the question until after the talk, yeah. So, <laughs> so there are all sorts of kinds of knots. So that one was a particularly simple one called a trefoil. Um, here's a different one that's called a figure eight knot. It's different than the others, than the other one. It's, though it's, you might struggle to say why it's exactly different. Uh, it's some other kind of tangle that you could study. Physicists have actually long been interested in knots. So for instance, in the late 1800s, uh, some physicists thought that knots might explain all of chemistry. They thought that every atom might be a kind of knot. And uh, for instance, Thompson thought that sodium might be this, this thing called the Hopf link, which is some kind of uh, two pieces of string that can't be undone without cutting each other. So that was, they set about tabulating all sorts of possible knots, uh, thinking that this would be the key to all of chemistry. And OK, so that, that theory was eventually debunked when I mean, the modern theory of the atom came about. But uh, the mathematical interest in knots persisted and was an interesting branch of topology. And it was reinvigorated uh, in some work, especially by Ed Witten, uh, who showed that there's a rich connection between knots and anions. And the idea is what I was saying before, that if we think of this as a birth-death process of anions, not just ordinary particles, then the fact that they are anions and, they have su and anions have such rich properties when they're exchanged will enable us to study mathematical properties of this knot by thinking about it as a world line trajectory of quantum particles. So that was a very striking connection between physics and mathematics, quantum particles and the theory of knots. And today that model is still used to study uh, both the mathematics of knots and the aspects of physics of anions. So maybe I'll stop here and we can go to questions. Well, why don't we begin the discussion period by discussing the particles going back as words and forwards in time? That one? <laughs> you Do first. you want me to say a word? No, you first. <laughs> well, so in nature, there are things called antiparticles. For example, uh, your doctor might uh, order a PET scan, but uh, which involves positrons, antiparticles. 
And Feynman had the insight that you can think of an antiparticle as a particle going backwards in time. So this is Andrew. It's a little, Here, I didn't I practice. It. Well, that's okay. <laughs> I didn't practice as Clay may have with these <laughs> little devices. But anyway, at the assuming the time is running vertically at the bottom is a particle antiparticle creation process. And this notion of the antiparticles, the particle going backwards in time, is so built up into the way physicists think that um, Clay used the post Feynman language kind of in describing it. Uh, why don't we? Uh, yes, Ian. I was hanging around with Wikipedia the other day, as some of us sometimes do, and I landed on the page of Anyons, and there was a claim there that uh, was a little surprising. They claimed that the, ex the fact that Anyons have been seen experimentally is a fact that is debated. Could, do you know anything about that? Could you comment on that? So Anyons come in all sorts of varieties. Um, one very simple kind is the kind that is, has this angle involved when they're exchanged. That part has definitely been seen experimentally. Then there are much more exotic kinds of anions that have an even richer sort of behavior uh, when they're exchanged. And that, um, whether or not those have been conclusively seen in experiments is, is still um, somewhat debated. I guess Clay means that the systems that are, whose interpretation is clear, are the fractional quantum Hall systems, as opposed to the more exotic new equals five half systems and the like. Uh, other questions? Yes? Does the ability of physicists to explain anion behavior depends on uh, the ability to efficiently distinguish different types of knots from each other? I would say the answer is uh, no. Um, though uh, it's more like, <laughs> yeah, I think the answer is probably no. Uh, but it is true that thinking of knots as trajectories of, of anions is a helpful way to compute er invariance of knots. Yes, yes. Well, it's a hard problem with the classical computer to distinguish knots. But in a sense, the converse to your question is the idea behind what's called topological quantum computing. So there's a whole uh, school of physicists trying to build what's called a quantum computer, where the information processes would have quantum variables built into it, as opposed to standard classical computers. And one strategy is what's called topological quantum computing which uses precisely the fact that although it's extremely hard with our computers to calculate the amplitude for a quantum trajectory such as this one, nature can do it very efficiently using quantum mechanics. And that means that if we could build a quantum computer, we'd be able to efficiently solve those problems that are, as you said, extremely difficult with classical computers. Uh, any other questions? You mentioned during your talk that anions only exist in two dimensions and not three dimensions. Could you comment on why why that is? Yeah. So uh, for that, so throughout the talk, I had this uh, visualization where this was space and this was time. To explain this point, it's helpful to uh, to change and suppress time. So we'll imagine that we look just as we humans see space and time. We'll think of time as auxiliary, and we just see space. So then uh, the question really comes about is what kind of different particle trajectories are there? So if we're in three space and one time dimension, which is our ordinary uh, trajectory, then I, if I think of myself as a big particle, and this is the uh, world line of some other particle, you could look at what kinds of trajectories it can it have. Well, it looks like it can go around me like this. But actually, there's no one, it, that trajectory where it goes around me can be continuously moved to the trajectory where it doesn't go around me. So that's what's happening in three space dimensions. Now, if we look at the situation in two space dimensions, like the surface of the table, the situation is completely different. So imagine there's a big particle there. So it's two dimensions, so it lo just looks like a hole in this table. And now, 
if the particle goes around that hole, there's no way for me to continuously pull it through. There's something stuck there. And that's the invariant difference between two and three dimensions. Yes. What is the, what is the duration of life uh, of the onions? Uh, and is it something that is stable? Or is there a wide range of uh, duration? Well, I think you want to say that the anion is stable yes, because it has exotic quantum numbers. Yes, but so technically, the lightest thing with its exotic quantum numbers is stable. But in yeah. the, I, I, maybe he meant in the actual, uh, actual experiment. Uh, I gave an idealized answer yes, for yes. a pure sample, yes. <laughs> which probably is what I thought was probably what you yes. wanted. Uh, an isolated anion in a, in a pure sample is stable. Yes. <coughs> Can you describe what the experiments look like? What they look like? Yes. What machines, what, how do you confirm, how do you see these things? Thanks. Well, you have to, <coughs> the first thing is you have to actually force uh, the particles that you're studying to be on the surface of the material. So that's usually done with a big magnetic field. And how do they actually observe what is the signature of the anion? Do you know, Ed? Well, the simplest, uh, the basic experiment, which won the Nobel Prize, um, my if you, in a typical wire, if there's an electric field, the current will go that way. But in the presence of the strong magnetic field that Clay mentioned, it, it actually goes perpendicular to the electric field. And uh, the strength with which it goes perpendicular has very, very surprising quantum properties. And in particular, those can be symptoms of an anion. So that was how it was first discovered that materials, certain materials contain anions. To measure, to, um, to show more precisely that that interpretation is correct it takes more complicated experiments. But the basic one that pinpoints the right materials is measuring what I've just told you about, which is called the Hall effect. You have a magnetic field, then there's an electric field that tries to push electrons this way, but due to reasons of a quantum nature, they go sideways instead. As an anthropologist, I'm used to dealing with folks who have rather different views of the cosmos than I do. But I find myself, even though I know you're speaking my mother tongue, <laughs> <laughs> listening to you guys with a view of the universe that is not quite mine. So I guess what I'm really asking is, do you walk around in your ordinary life imagining the world to be constructed very differently than, say, before you began these studies? Are you a completely different culture than me? <laughs> <laughs> and though I'm intrigued by you, as an anthropologist would be, I don't understand half of what you just said. <laughs> uh, let me say one thing, which is that there is a kind of language barrier. So all the words that we use, that I used to describe what was going on, they're really imprecise stand-ins for, for mathematics, for equations that enable us to more precisely make sense of what we're talking about. So it is not just a linguistic characterization. There's a, there, is a math there is a precise language behind it, and that's really essential. As to whether you know, I, I worry about uh, anions in my day-to-day -day life, <laughs> I mean, when I'm at work, yes. <laughs> I'm glad to tell you that learning about the quantum world doesn't make one forget the classical world. <laughs> <laughs> to, to go back to the, the question about ex uh, experiment, uh, maybe, I, maybe you said it and I missed it. Uh, but the uh, evidence of onions, uh, did it come from calculation? So was it by deduction, uh, deductive reasoning, and, and then confirmed empirically? Or uh, was it uh, a discovery by uh, uh, almost uh, by chance uh, uh, through uh, an ex something that was uh, different or unexpected in an experiment? Uh, 
Well, so I'd say the fractional quantum Hall effect, and even before the integral one, but we don't have time to explain the difference today, was a surprise. It was an experimental discovery without being looked for. Then there was a theoretical interpretation, which led one to expect that such materials would have anions. And that's been supported by subsequent measurements. But the start, start of the whole thing was an unexpected discovery. I might say there's a long prior history where people speculated that anions logically could exist in a two-dimensional material, but they had no idea where to look. And when the right materials were found, it wasn't definitely not by people who were looking for anions. Discussion, but to come back to DJ's question, isn't isn't it true that so there is this thing that's called a fractional quantum Hall effect yeah. that you can measure? Isn't it true that if you think of the particles as anions, then you understand what's going on? So yeah. in a sense, it's uh, it's an effective way of uh, of seeing an anion. Is if you think of them as anions, yeah. then you explain what you yeah. see. Right. So you, you mentioned that photons are bosons, uh, electrons are are fermions. There are no there's not a thing that you can give me that here, here's, that's an anion, right? Well, one believes there is inside these particular systems. Uh -huh. um, but, well, it's not as simple as observing a photon. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.